My boyfriend of eight years has lied to me, cheated on me, and manipulated me into a poly relationship. I still love him, should I stay with him? We've been dating for eight years, working together for seven of those years. During five of those years, we have started our own business with another friend. My boyfriend's father passed away unexpectedly in March 2021. Boyfriend became distant for obvious reasons, I tried to support him the best I can emotionally while running our business. Fast forward to October, he tells me he wants to go visit his friends a town over by himself. I think none of it but seeing he's trying to get back to his lively self. I get a call around 5 about how angry will you be if I do spooky stuff without you? I was a little upset since I felt left out but said sure. He kept texting me until 10, saying he'd be home in a bit. Then turns off his phone. He finally turns it back on at 7, makes an excuse about being too drunk to drive home and doesn't feel like arguing. I'm livid. Not to mention it was our anniversary weekend. We talked it through. And moved on with the event in the back of my mind. November continued with him having weekends wanting to go out with friends but returning home on time. I couldn't shake my gut feeling. We go on a vacation just the two of us out of the country. He passed out drunk from drinking with some strangers. I can't help myself and look through his phone. I miss you. Wish you were here. My stomach dropped and I resisted all urges to smother him in his sleep. I confronted him the next morning since he was too drunk to function. He accuses me of ruining the vacation. Why now? I felt betrayed and angry. He promised to never contact her again. She meant nothing. Less than a week goes by, and he tells me he needs to talk to her. They were just friends. He insisted. That they had connected over his father's death and she had been emotionally supporting him. I suggest we go to couple therapy, he immediately shoots it down. I told him to do whatever he wanted since he couldn't keep a simple promise with someone that meant nothing. I had fallen into a horrible depression and went to the doctor to get some meds before I hurt myself. Few weeks go by and he brings up that he wants us to have an open, poly relationship. With her. Hell no. While it wasn't the first time he brought up an open relationship the thought of her in my life revolted me. He continues to harass me for the next few months until I finally agree in June due to an ultimatum. Polly or I continue to cheat on you. I can't be monogamous I immediately regretted opening the door. He begins spending more time with her. Going on trips. We continue to distance. He begs me to meet her, to give her a chance, I do. Nothing changes. He finally realizes our business is not doing well due to his negligence. Plans to start helping more and scheduling properly to assure we are all getting the proper time. Similar to how most people complain, getting home late to stare at his phone, really didn't count as spending time with me. I found out from a friend that he had taken her to dinner with friends. I confronted him over the phone since I'm out of town. He said it didn't mean anything but I felt hurt. We talk it through before hanging up he asks how mad will I be if I take her to see my uncle I hang up on him not wanting to continue to fight. He opened yet another door, now family. By September, I had enough. I told him I was tired of being ignored, toxic and depressed. He asked if I had found someone new. I just didn't want to continue being in a poly relationship with people that had betrayed me. I felt a third wheel in my own relationship. He begged me once again, a new plan. I agree with the exception that we go to couples therapy. A month goes by, still no therapy. I've had enough and brought it up again. I wanted him out of my house, I wanted us to break up unless he left her. He brings up the reason he's with her is because I don't provide him with what he needs, to be desired and intimate. We'd always struggled with him in the past. Our drives are completely the opposite. We talk, we hash out a plan. Again. Final straw. Her or me. I wanted to work on us, rebuild our relationship, and find each other. Be happy. He agreed but that it needed to be next time he saw her that he didn't want to do it over text. Okay. They had plans to go to Halloween. I show interest in what they are doing since he's going to be gone Friday slash Saturday. He asks me if I want to come and that it'd be nice if I get along with her. I snapped. It's been two months of me telling him I feel like I'm on thin ice over our situation. He said he didn't realize he had a timeline to break up with her. I asked him what would be a good date for him then. He said the end of January after their cruise. I felt defeated. I told him if he couldn't stay with me while he was with her, he needed to find his own place. I'm done. I give up. I stared into space as he muttered these while packing. You are throwing me away. I'm sorry I exist. I didn't realize I meant nothing to you. If I'm not with you, I'm leaving her too good luck tonight. I'm going to cry myself to sleep. After a week, I caved. Let him back home. Couldn't stand him saying he was homeless. I feel empty now when I'm with him. I made it clear I didn't want the person who triggers my betrayal trauma in my life but he's adamant I won't like the next person he finds. We started talking again. Holidays are coming up. She's upset since she's unsure how he's going to spend them with her. His birthday is coming up. Asked him what he wanted. Said it'd be nice if all three of us could get lunch or dinner. I told him, if I did, to be 100% clear, 
still doesn't mean I want them in my life. I'd like to run away. But I feel trapped due to our business and life. I do still somewhat love him but right now I feel numb. If I let myself feel, I know he's just going to hurt me. The constant. Roller coaster has been hell. I know I don't want Polly but it's hard to leave someone you've built a life with. My friend got a DUI and I tried to break him out despite being a military police officer, so I got in big trouble when I was caught. I was in the military but we were stateside. There was a group of fellow buddies with me. This was the night we all learned what a Jager bomb shot was. We had round after round after round after round. The night went by extremely fast and my friend Brian decided he would drive myself and my roommate home to our off-base appointment. We left the bar and it was not long before we were pulled over. Turns out that a sedan having three, 21-year-olds leaving a bar at 2 a.m., near a military base is suspicious. The police officer knew we were all drunk when he got to Brian's car window and we all admitted to it. The police officer gave Brian a breathalyzer test which he promptly failed. The office handcuffed Brian and put him in the back of the police car. The officer then asked myself and the other passenger, who again was my roommate, if we would like to take a breath test and see if we were below the legal limit to drive Brian's car to our apartment so that it would not be towed and therefore would save Brian the impound charges. We took our breath tests and promptly failed. This is when things begin to get weird. The officer left us with Brian's car with the car keys also. The officer drove off with Brian to take him to the local jail for booking. To this day I don't know why he left us with Brian's keys. From the time the officer pulled us over it had been approximately 20 minutes. My roommate and I had an oh so bright idea. This idea was followed by several ideas that escalated very quickly. My roommate and I were military police officers. We felt bad that we let our friend drive us home and he got into trouble. With an extreme lack of judgment and against all of our common sense we decided that we would drive Brian's car back to our apartment. We didn't have far to drive but this doesn't excuse the absolute stupidity that we were acting upon. At some point between the time we started driving Brian's car and the time we arrived at our apartment, my roommate and I came up with a grand plan of how to get Brian out of jail. This was a multi-staged plan and I will break it down, get Brian's car back to our apartment. Brush our teeth and put gum in. Shave and get into our military police uniforms. Attach our guard belts to our waist so that we look like we were on duty. Call my precinct on base and inform the dispatch not to call the jail that Brian was at. I knew who was working dispatch that night and that person just so happened to owe me a big favor. I made it clear that I would not explain why I was asking dispatch not to call this specific jail. Dispatch agreed not to call. I called the jail Brian was at and told them that I was my command and that I was checking to see if any military members were in their jail. They stated yes and stated Brian's name. I asked if it would be okay if we come and take Brian into custody. They said yes. Switch cars. Leave Brian's car at our apartment and drive one of our own to the jail. One last pep talk and walk out the door. We arrive at the jail and it's around 4 a.m. and very quiet, no other cars in the jail parking lot. We go to the jail entrance and ring a buzzer. A corrections officer speaks to us through an intercom system. I speak into the intercom while looking into a camera and I inform the corrections office that we are there to take custody of Brian. They said okay. It took about 25 minutes before we heard anything further and as you could imagine we were scared out of our minds and it felt like an eternity. It felt like the exact fear you would feel if you were trying to break a friend out of jail. Then without warning a loud buzzer sound goes off. The large thick metal door in front of us slides open and on the other side we see two corrections officers. And. Brian in handcuffs. I've never personally seen a ghost but at that. Moment I knew what a person's face would look like if they ever had seen one. Brian's jaw dropped and his face went extremely flush, ghost white. I greeted the corrections officers and told them I will put my handcuffs on Brian so that they can have theirs back. Before doing so I turned Brian around and gave him a pat down. I swapped the handcuffs and. That was it, I had Brian in custody. My roommate and I thanked the corrections officers and we turned and walked away with our hearts beating out of our chest. We are walking across the parking lot to our vehicle when my roommate whispers to me, don't get in the car, don't get in the car. At that moment a police officer walks up behind us and looks us dead in the eyes then asks us, aren't you two the passengers of the vehicle I just pulled over tonight? It was this moment that our hearts stopped and so did our breathing. Like I said, the parking lot was empty when we arrived. No one inside or outside of the jail had caught on to us. It just so happens that the arresting officer arrived at the jail while we were in the Sally Port waiting for Brian to be released to us. The arresting officer was just sitting there doing paperwork in his patrol car in the jail parking lot as we walked Brian out of the jail into our car. I'm sure you can guess what happened next. Yep, we all got put in jail. About 8 a.m. our command actually came and got us. We got back to base and they told me to go home and that they would call me when they needed me and to get my things in order because this was not going to go over well. I did just that and then arrived back at my command 24 hours later and I did not leave for 45 days and then we were deployed again so I never got off base again during that stateside stay. I was punished to the fullest extent of the uniform code of military justice, the military law. I was a disappointment to many people because of this. I felt ashamed and I took my punishment. All the while I was the most famous person at my command. I represented what it was to have your fellow military personnel's back 100%. Everyone heard about this attempt to break Brian out of jail and we were practically celebrities. To this day I cannot figure how in the hell I had the stupidity to try and pull this off. I am proud to say that this did not ruin my military career and that I did get to serve out my enlistment and be discharged honorably. Needless to say I have never F.U. this bad ever again in my life. The military absolutely did not condone this behavior but in some sort of way we were looked at as the most loyal friends a person could have.
Our entire command had camaraderie like never before. It was crazy, insane, and stupid. I found out my creepy friend has been using my pictures to catfish a guy she has been talking to for years. My best friend and I met during our freshman year of college. We are now roommates and moved in together two years ago. In 2015, my best friend spent spring break a couple states away, and matched with a guy on Tinder. When she came back to campus she immediately told me about him and how amazing he was and how they only went out to dinner once, edit, this was obviously a lie, but that they were talking 24-7. I got super excited and asked to see a pic. That was the only picture of him she's ever shown me. Over the past five years he's literally been her whole world. She talks about him constantly. She always has her nose in her phone. She gets clingy when he takes too long to text back, she's cried to me a few times because she's lurked on his social media and seen he was around other girls, my roommate doesn't have social media herself. I had asked a few times why they have never met up again and she said they're both too busy and don't have the money for the trip. I even told her that he could stay with us and that would save some money. He sends presents and even flowers on Valentine's Day every year. They've basically been dating this whole time. So yesterday my roommate picked up a shift at work and was gone. I get a knock on our door and I open it to a guy. He says hi, and I give a confused hi? And then he barges in and scoops me up into a hug. He starts saying I thought you were working? I was hoping your roommate was here so I could surprise you when you got back and I am so confused. I immediately get down and back away and let him know I have absolutely no clue what he's talking about. My brain can't even process what's happening. Then he looks confused, and says, Maggie? And I'm like no. That's my roommate? My roommate and I look nothing alike so I'm even more confused. Then something kind of clicks and I think oh my god is this the guy? She's been dating? So I say wait, are you Adam? And he gives me a very slow yes, and I get excited and say oh my god I bet Maggie is going to flip out. I can't believe you're here. His demeanor completely changes. He asks me what I'm talking about. I'm Maggie? And I tell him no, I'm Summer. Maggie's roommate. At this point I'm still completely missing something he has just pieced together. He just says holy f and looks like he doesn't know what to say. Eventually he asks if he can sit down. I invite him in. He then proceeds to tell me for the past five years, he's thought he's been talking to me. Every picture he's ever seen of Maggie has actually been pictures of me. I'm completely dumbfounded and we don't know what to say to each other at first. So he gets out his phone and shows me proof. He has tons of pictures of me saved on his phone, and went to their messages and showed me proof that she's been sending them to him. I felt and still feel completely sick to my stomach. I get out my phone and show him real pictures of her. I tell him maybe they could just talk when she gets off of work? And he's really pissed at this point. I say maybe we should call her first and let her know he's here. So I do that and she starts flipping out. Saying she's not coming home. Tells him to leave and that she won't talk to him. He calls her and starts yelling at her over the phone. After everyone calms she eventually comes home. He's hurt and accusing, she's crying, I'm sitting there awkwardly. She tells him that she's still the same person he's had feelings for and he screams at her, no, I thought I was in love with your roommate. And that completely makes her break down so I tell him maybe he should leave for the night and everyone should have their own space. He agrees and after he leaves she goes completely psychotic on me and starts throwing poop around the living room. Tells me she hates me, I start crying, it's a mess. I left to stay with a friend and haven't been back so I don't know what's gone down. I feel like I have no idea who the person I'm living with is and I feel weirdly violated. Do I move out? Do I try to call her? I think my friend's boyfriend is purposely hurting her under the guise of being clumsy plus update. My, F26, friend K, F26, has been dating Andrew, M25, for almost a year now. Honestly until these last months I really like them together and he has assimilated into our friend group really well. He's been easy to talk to and is someone who I thought could be the perfect match to K. In the beginning Andrew has always been known for being clumsy, occasionally spilling on himself, tripping and sometimes just being an overall goof, we joked he was the poster child of a himbo. It started with a simple mistake, Andrew spilling wine on Kay's outfit. He seemed so apologetic, and genuinely sorry. Then a couple days later at a potluck, Andrew bumps into Kay while she was bringing out a salad bowl causing it to fall on her foot and giving her a pretty nasty bruise. Again apologetic, but this time just rubbed me the wrong way. It seemed awkward the way he had bumped into her. Then there were just more of these accidents like ripping a dress when he was falling trying to catch his balance, dropping a bowl of chocolate ice cream on her shoes, and spilling an ashtray that landed all over her hair. All of this is just giving me a weird feeling, like why does it feel like his clumsiness is getting worse? Recently we were having a movie night. Kay was sitting on the floor and I had gotten up from the couch to get some more popcorn when I saw Andrew walking over with hot tea, I'm thinking no way I'm going to have her get piping hot tea spilled on her by accident. So I get up and say oh thanks for grabbing this, do you mind grabbing me popcorn since you're closest he kind of gets a defensive tone with me saying yeah but let me give this to Kay first I said no it's not a problem I'll give it to her. As sweet as possible and took the mug out of his hands and gave it to Kay. He seemed kind of distant the whole rest of the evening. 
I talked with one of my friends in our group just about the tea drama and she said that Andrew might have been pissed off feeling like I was babying him. I think that if he's been prone to hurting his girlfriend wouldn't he want to avoid situations that could get her seriously hurt? Wouldn't you want a friend to help you? Am I just overthinking this? I want to talk to Kay about my concerns soon because I'm really scared for her, I just want to be wise in how I speak to her because I don't want her to take anything I say the wrong way. Any advice would be so helpful. Update I talked to Kay this morning. I started off the conversation normal, when Kay says hey why were you concerned about Andrew bringing me tea? I just say I had noticed he'd been more clumsy lately and I wanted to avoid either of you of getting hurt. She was quiet for a bit then asked me do you think it's odd how he's been acting? Considering all your advice I respond with I care about you and want you to be safe, I don't want to hurt you or Andrew but I feel like most of the accidents have come at your expense. I don't want it to get to a point where you have a worse injury. This is when Kay burst out crying like I have never seen. After composing herself enough to talk she says she's been so suspicious of how these accidents have been centered around her and how validating it was to have someone feel the same way. It's been causing her a lot of anxiety and she felt so relieved when I took the teacup away from him. She has tried to suggest to Andrew that he should go to a doctor, but he just says he's perfectly fine. Kay is not confrontational so she just drops it. She said how recently Sarah, Andrew and her were all hanging out together. Sarah told Andrew I was so upset about how he was hesitant to hand me the teacup, a completely different story from what Sarah told me. I have been more open with my emotions in my post due to my anonymity, but in person I was very casual about the situation. I said something along the lines of hey did you think I upset Andrew by taking the tea when I asked him to get me popcorn, I hope I didn't come off rude. Then Kay told me something really disturbing, how during this conversation Andrew and Sarah started joking about Kay being a battered wife. How ridiculous the idea would be if Andrew was really abusing her and some really dark jokes. This had Kay feeling like she was crazy to think that these accidents might be on purpose. Also they had said some things about me that made her so upset she couldn't even tell me. Kay said she's felt trapped, living with him and how he's intertwined in our group. She felt like she needed to wait to have proof he was faking it to make it worth a bunch of drama. I feel horrible that she's felt so alone in this. I was pretty blunt and just asked do you still love him? She responded I don't, I think I don't even like him anymore. So we talked about the best way for Kay to leave Andrew, being as safe as possible. Kay called in sick to work and we went over to her house and talked with our friend Leah, her roommate. Andrew was out at work, so we quickly moved all their things into Leah's room, she has a key to her door. Anything that was super sentimental to either of them we packed in my car. Kay is going to stay at my house and Leah wants to stay with a family member who lives not too far away. Kay has written a letter to Andrew ending things, she is going full no contact. She set a date that she expects him to leave, he moved in with them so he doesn't have his name on the lease. Our friends Mike and Corey will be staying at the house. This is to ensure nothing will be damaged due to an accident also to let Kay and Leah know when it's safe to come back. The previous tenant of my new flat left a survival guide. I'm not sure I want to live here anymore. I moved in with my boyfriend yesterday. We've been together for five years now and we're old and wise enough to settle down and finally leave our parents' houses. He just turned 24 and I'm 22. He's the love of my life. His name is Jamie and I couldn't be happier to be living with him. Jamie works for a local 24-hour fast food restaurant and I'm training to be a teacher. The early stages of training don't pay much and I owe a lot in student loans so finances are tough. We had almost given up hope until we found our flat. It was nothing special, but to us it was a palace. A spacious two-bedroom apartment with views of a city park, a balcony and local conveniences. It was in a tower block in a not-so-nice area, but neither of us had been wealthy growing up, we weren't fussy. Just grateful to be together. The advert was sweetened by the deposit-free option and open-ended tenancy. The landlord was happy to sign a five-year contract if we wanted. That sort of thing never happens in the city. We were told that along with no deposit we would also have no inspections, but would be liable to pay for any damage when we ended the tenancy. I'd never heard of anything quite like it, so we moved in quickly. We slept soundly last night, I felt safe and happy. I don't think that feeling is coming back anytime soon and it's all due to the note I found this morning. I found it in the kitchen, having a coffee, hours after Jamie had left for his early shift at work. It was in one of the cupboards that were fixed to the wall, there were a bunch of useful items from the previous tenant. Spare keys to the flat, a set of tiny keys that locked and unlocked the windows, necessary for those with kids this high up, spare smoke alarm batteries and a folded up piece of paper. The note was handwritten with new occupier of flat 42 and beautiful cursive on the blank side. I opened it up and sat down too. Read. I can't really describe it to you, so I'm going to copy it out below. Dear new occupier, firstly, welcome to your new home. I lived here before you for 35 years with my husband. Unfortunately he had an incident at home recently that I'd rather not discuss that claimed his life. My sister has now decided I can't keep up with the demands of the property and has insisted that I move in with her and her husband. I was reluctant at first, but the stairs do kill me at my age and without Bernie it's filled with sadness. It's a wonderful home, honestly, 
I have lived through the best and worst years and leaving it behind is very emotional but if you are to survive and get the best out of it then there are some steps you need to follow. 1. The landlord will never bother you, he doesn't visit, call or communicate in any way. But make sure to pay your rent in a timely fashion always. I have only dealt with him once in 35 years and let's just say I never missed another rent day. Any repairs required you speak to the agent you rented the place with. 2. Do not use the communal lift between 1.11 and 3.33 a.m. Just don't do it. This step is vital if you are to have a happy life here. It really is life or death. Don't do it. This has cost me and many others in the building greatly and I would rather not elaborate on why you shouldn't do this. Just please don't do it. I cannot stress this enough. 3. When you hear the strange animal noises coming from flat 48 don't question it, Mr. Prentice lives there and he's a lovely chap. Don't be afraid to say hello to him in the corridor or on the stairs, he's old school, so he never risks the lift, but whatever you do, don't check on him when you hear the noises. You'll know when you hear them. 4. If you ever come across a window cleaner on the balcony, ignore him. He may seem like the nicest fellow you've ever had trying to sell you something at the door but it really is best that you don't engage. He will go away if you ignore him. But. He tries pretty hard the first few times so you'll need some resilience. Whatever you do, don't offer him anything. No money, no hot drink. 5. Don't leave food scraps out. Bin or refrigerate them immediately. If you have small animals, it is imperative that you watch them eat and take away any leftover food immediately after they are done. This and rule 2 go hand in hand, the things forage all day and seem to really love animal feed. You don't want them in your flat. I promise. You can leave what you want out between 1.11 and 3.33 a.m. so you may want to feed your pets then. 6. Don't communicate with any neighbors who claim to come from flat 65 to 72. These flats suffered a fire in the late 80s that devastated the whole floor, all the residents died in their homes. The building was mostly council owned at the time and they never bothered to renovate the flats. They've been empty ever since but every now and again someone will knock at your door claiming to live in one of these flats and ask to borrow some sugar. They will seem entirely average but you must shut and lock the door immediately. I installed two extra security bolts to avoid these F-seekers. I don't like to swear at my age but they really are F-seekers. 7. Simple one for you here, keep a weapon in each room. Sometimes you follow all these steps and something still slips through the net. Better to be safe than sorry. 8. The building has a committee that will try and get you to join. It's one of those neighborhood groups about improving living conditions for all residents. It's a nice group and the lady who runs it, Terry from Flat 26 is a fantastic neighbor. By all means get involved. But I wouldn't recommend babysitting Terry's two children. She'll ask you, because the poor woman needs a break, but if you accept, don't say I didn't warn you. 9. Stray hairless cats sometimes roam in the hallway. I know they're supposedly a special, expensive breed, but they don't belong to anyone. They're mostly harmless, but don't pick them up. Not unless you see one of those neighbors that claims to live in 65 to 72. Then grab the cat and lock it inside with you. It'll burn your skin a little but the cats are friendly and I wouldn't want to see them hurt. 10. There is no way to fix the damp patch on the ceiling in the bedroom. Sometimes it will turn a deep crimson and look quite concerning, but please try not to be alarmed, it doesn't drip, it doesn't get any bigger and it's been there longer than I have. The landlord won't budge on it, according to the agents. I flagged it many times, even called the police the first night it changed color, but it was a waste of time and it will be for you too. It's best to ignore it. 11. You can trust the postman. His name is Ian Flanders and he's been the postman since before I moved in. He has his own key to the main door and delivers post to the door every morning at 8.54. I can't include everything here, or it would become a novel but if you have any questions Ian will help you. 12. Finally, the first few weeks are the worst. You'll feel like you've made a mistake, I'm sure reading this you already do, but if you can get through the first few weeks it really is a lovely block to live in. Every property has its quirks and this one is a little extra special, but you can be truly happy here if you just take my advice. I wish you all the best, I really do. Yours truly, Mrs. Prudence Hemmings. There were parts of the note I couldn't disprove, there was indeed a large damp patch above the bed that me and Jamie had already discussed reporting. No crimson but it definitely existed. I had also commented on a beautiful sphinx cat roaming the halls as we were moving in. I started to get seriously freaked out. Our dream, our beautiful little home had just become a source of fear and confusion. I checked the time and it was 9.14. Damn it. Out of time to catch postman Ian. When I opened the door to check, sure enough, two letters addressed to a Mrs. Hemmings. Sat on the doorstep. At about 11.15 my worst fears were truly confirmed when a friendly middle-aged looking man carrying window cleaning equipment knocked on my balcony door. I ignored him. I didn't want to take the risk until I'd spoken to Jamie and showed him the note. I texted him all ready to rush home. I felt bad as the man wrapped his knuckles against the door for over 10 minutes, but honestly the longer it went on the more I was terrified. 
My windows were sparkling, and due to our lack of curtains I couldn't even hide from his gaze. I felt so exposed. He stayed for a total of 30 minutes exactly and never once did he stop looking at me or knocking. He shouted the occasional ultra-friendly line or humble request for a beverage in the heat through the door but I did my best to avoid eye contact. When he finally left I looked outside every window in the flat, but I couldn't see him on any of the other balconies or see any equipment suggesting he was around. He had vanished completely. Jamie still hadn't texted me back, he must have been having a rough shift, it was a Friday and they were always busy. It wasn't often that he didn't reply. He was due home in around an hour anyway. I read the note probably hundreds of times over, I tortured myself reading it for the next hour. Desperately waiting for Jamie to come through the door to tell me it was all crazy and I should relax. I hoped for that so much. But Jamie never came. His shift should have finished around the day but by 2 p.m. he still wasn't home. I panicked, I cried, I left over 100 voice messages on his phone but got nowhere. I finally decided it had been long enough that calling his work wouldn't embarrass him and his boss told me that he had never turned up for his shift. I thought about it, what could have happened? And then it hit me. Jamie's shift started at 4 a.m. today. He would have left the flat at 3.15 and taken the lift down the stairs. I don't know what to do. I've tried to convince myself it was all just a big joke. Maybe Jamie wrote the note and got his boss in on it. A voice in my head kept telling me that he couldn't write like that if he tried but I had to attempt to fool myself. It's getting late and he still isn't home, what if it's all true? After 30 years of being open, my family's restaurant is closing tonight. My family has owned a fine dining Italian restaurant since before I was born. Most of my childhood memories are in that restaurant. Every day after school I go do my homework at the bar, I follow my dad around the kitchen and help with little things like making salads, and I will never forget making my first pizza at 4 years old. Whenever it stormed really bad and we lost power my family would go and sleep on the floor in the dining room, it was always a safe space. It was always somewhere for us to go, something for us to do, something that needed constant watering and attention. It's been my family's livelihood for my entire existence. It kept my belly full as well as my heart. It's my father's lifelong work and it's made me respect him so much after 30 years of being there to cook for 14 plus hours a day. I don't know who I'd be without this restaurant. It shaped me in ways that I couldn't possibly explain over a Reddit post. It's made me confident, brave, not scared of a little heat, and I've built incredible relationships with a staff that I've been so lucky to work with for so long. I started taking it seriously when I was about 15. I was a biz girl at first. And then I was a hostess. And when I got a little older I became a server. I wasn't very good at that one, especially after spilling red wine on one too many older women and embarrassing myself beyond comparison. I realized at 18 or so, that like my father, I was a cook. I'm 24 now and I've been cooking alongside my dad every day since I realized I had a knack for it. It's been beautiful, exhausting, exhilarating, very mentally and emotionally taxing, just an overall whirlwind of emotions every single day. I even made the crazy decision to drop out of college to run the restaurant full-time. I love it though. I love working with my family. I love making people happy and seeing them enjoy the food we work so hard to make. Tonight is our last shift ever. Things were going so well over the holidays this past winter but ever since COVID hit, it's been a different story. We had to close to the public for three months. And since we've been open with limited occupancy, we're not pulling in those great numbers that we once were. We can no longer afford the rent at our building and had to make the tough decision to close our doors for good. But besides that, it's time. My parents are in their 60s. My dad can't do it anymore. His health is starting to drastically fail because of all the years being constantly on his feet. And he doesn't want me to have the same life that he did, never being able to give any part of life besides work real attention. My mom and dad are ready to retire and I don't blame them. I'm nervous about tonight. After all these years, this very well might be the last restaurant shift I ever work. I don't know what the future holds for me, but I don't think I have any interest in continuing my cooking career elsewhere. I decided that without the restaurant, there's not much keeping me in our town so in October I'm going to take a big risk and move across the country. I'm terrified. I've been terrified every day leading up to today. It's hard to imagine what life is going to be like for me after we close our doors tonight. I've just never known anything else. I thought it might feel good to tell this story to some faceless strangers. If you read this far, thank you. Please continue to support your locally owned restaurants. The families who own them put a lot of blood, sweat, and tears into running them. Tip your servers well. Thank the chefs if you run into them. Enjoy good food for the rest of your life and eat it with passion. I had a girl over for a date, but she went crazy and now there's video of me dragging her body down the hall and dumping it in the elevator. I got a rescue puppy back in January and she was terrified of everything and everyone. There was a pet store down the street I used to carry her to to try and expose her to the outside world and other people. The girl who worked at the pet store instantly bonded with my puppy, wow. My dog wouldn't let anyone else go near her without her crying or peeing or being terrified. So naturally we became regulars, and the more and more I interacted with this girl and the more I saw her interactions with my dog and other people in the store she seemed super sweet and just an all-around good person. 
I asked her for her number, even though I felt uncomfortable doing that to a woman in her place of work but she seemed receptive, so that's good. It's also surprisingly hard to meet someone in my city. We exchanged a few messages and went for a walk with my dog together. Everything seems great. She's educated. Cute. Loves animals. Everything seems great. We ended up back at my place for a few drinks, four or five max, this is kind of an important detail, and we stopped drinking around 10 p.m. and she ends up staying over. Now here's where it all goes downhill. I woke up in the middle of the night and she was yelling at herself about how her dad is an a-hole, and some other crazy talk, very scattered subjects, hence why I can't be more specific but that one stuck out to me. Very strange behavior for 2 a.m. I tried to calm her down or try and figure out what the f was going on. She didn't even seem to notice she was doing it, oh I'm sorry did I wake you? We had a really nice evening, but this girl just turned crazy. There was clearly something wrong she wasn't shouting at me. She wasn't even shouting at herself just into nothing, into a void. I repeatedly tried to stop her, but she couldn't see the issue as if she wasn't even aware she was doing it. Eventually I just gave up and went to sleep on the sofa because I just couldn't deal with it. She came in and cried and said she didn't mean to upset me and can we just go back to sleep together? Sure. That's all I wanted anyway. Can we please just sleep and can you please just stop shouting slash yelling, talking? When we got to the bedroom she turned around and she had the craziest eyes I've ever seen, and I've dated redheads. And says don't you ever effing talk to me like that ever again or I swear to god. Now at this point I've seen behavior like this before and it's very concerning. Nope. Get out. I cut her short on whatever threats she was going to make. Get the f out. Q crying again but I'm a girl you can't do this to me yeah I don't care I'm not doing this. It's 2am and I'm not having you talk to me like this. At this point there was a lot of back and forth from crying of but how am I meant to get home jumping to well f you I'm leaving. So she gathers her things and claims to not know how to get out the building. It's a condo building. You walk down the hall to an elevator. If there isn't an elevator. You went the wrong way so go the other way down the hall. Bearing in mind she lives in a condo building three blocks away. It's not like she doesn't know how a condo works or what area she is in. So I offer to walk her to the door, or at least the elevator, I want her out. But I'm not just going to throw her literally out the door without her things. I just want her out, there's clearly something not right and I don't want to deal with whatever it is or whatever will come of more of this behavior. So I help her gather her things and open the door for her and start showing her where the elevator is. Walking down the hall she collapsed. Like dead weight. And no she wasn't faking it. She was out cold, out of the blue. Just folded up right there in the hall. Now here's where I effed up. My thought process was hell nah, you're still. Leaving. So I drag her unconscious body down the hall and bundle her in the elevator. Yup. Very aware this was a mistake in hindsight, bearing in mind I was not expecting to be leaving, so you can imagine the look on the concierge's face when I rock up out of the elevator in my boxer short saying aw oh man I effed up you gotta help me here. He's calling 911 and sure enough, the elevator disappeared, up to the fourth floor. We called it back but obviously someone had tried to use the elevator and the door would have opened up to that train wreck. I'm sure the look on their face would have been priceless, anyway it came back and she was still unconscious. We're talking to the 911 operator answering the base questions, address, what happened etc, and just like a horror movie we turn around and she's awake. Stood there. Crazy eyes and all. She was awake long enough to yell at the concierge before she passed out again. This time hitting her head on the marble floor of the lobby. I'll never forget the sound of her head hitting the floor. Or the concierge's who wince at the sound of it. So here's how the 911 call went. He's on speakerphone with me and the concierge there. 911. Okay. So I need you to say now every time she takes a breath. And I don't want you to stop until I say so, do you understand? Me, yep. Got it 911. Okay start now, 911. Okay I don't think you understand my instructions, me, no dude. I understood. 911. Okay so start now and don't stop until I say so. Go. Me, okay, 911 again, me, dude. I understand. If she takes a breath I'll say now. So now of course she's not breathing. 911. Okay you need to start CPR and the concierge needs to go get a defibrillator. So here I am in my boxers doing CPR in the lobby of my building. A fire truck pulls up after only 2 minutes they have a defibrillator concierge still hasn't come back yet. So they take over and an ambulance follows shortly where they bundle her into the back and drive off. Holy. Poop what just happened. And of course now the cops turn up. Did I mention there's cameras in the elevator and just the part of the hallway that shows me dragging an unconscious girl, who is now not breathing. Yeah try explaining that one. So the cops want to know. Why are you kicking a girl out at 2am? And why is she not breathing? And what's this on video, I told them everything but of course they didn't believe me, so now I'm terrified. What if she's dead? Nothing about this looks good for me. What if she's alive but, clearly she has psychological issues and decides to remember things a different way. Or in her mind I attacked her. Or if the cops turn up and say what did he do? And then that triggers her to say I did something. Fast forward 3 days and every time the phone rings I'm expecting it to be the cops, I have no idea if this girl is alive or dead. Or if she woke up in hospital and the cops questioned her, what did he do to you? Etc etc every day I have this hanging over me. I don't know what to do. I did text to see if she was alive. No reply. I'm headed to the LCBO for a bottle of wine. And bang. She's right there in front of me. Hi. How's it going so great to see you. Erm. Um. Hi. I thought you were dead. 
Oh I was. But just for a few minutes haha yeah. I know. I was the one doing CPR. Oh. I'm sorry. That explains why my chest hurts I guess. Ha. Ah. Oh well. So you wanna hang out? We could go back to your place for some drinks again. She has no recollection. Wants to come hang out. Needless to say I said no. Glad you're alive. Good luck. Goodbye. She left me a two minute long voicemail a few days later crying and trying to apologize. I don't need that in my dog's life. Lay me off and replace me with two lazy workers? Enjoy losing thousands. I used to be in charge of the printer room in a rather large company. We shipped a poop ton of product every day, and everything shipped had to have the accompanying printed label slash documents. Nothing can even be loaded onto the trucks without this paperwork. Now this was in the olden days of the 90s, so we had seven massive, four foot tall dot matrix printers that did all the work. These printers were temperamental beaches, and if the paper jammed, the printer did not automatically stop printing. It would just keep pushing slash jamming more and more paper into the machine until, if left untended, it would break down. Running the printer room was a two person job. When I started I trained for two full weeks with the two current printer room employees it was a rough effing two weeks, let me tell you, getting the hang of the job, the various things you had to learn, do, etc. One thing that made it even more complicated was the fact that each printer had its own personality with its own problems. Another was the fact that a problem in one printer could have a different fix than the exact same problem in another. The job would be quiet for 45 minutes straight, during which we did routine maintenance and such, but was really slow and quiet and restful. Because this company processed its shipping orders in batches, once an hour. And then boy, on the hour, every hour, the batch of orders would go through and thousands and thousands of orders would come spitting out. Now, if you were on top of things and kept everything running smoothly, the orders would print out very neatly and quickly. But if you didn't know what you were doing, if you didn't maintain things just right, you'd get a backup and things would go to poop very, very fast. And when one machine went down you had to fix it fast, before the next one jammed, because guaranteed those machines would jam up multiple times on every batch print job. So I've been working the print room for several months, and things were great. Then my coworker gave his two weeks notice. We tried to train my replacement, but he was incredibly lazy and got fired fairly a few days after the end of his training. Which left me in the printer room alone. Then the bosses informed me that my position is being phased out, and I'm going to be replaced by two employees transferred from a different department. So not only am I losing my job, but I have to train my replacements. And I desperately needed a good recommendation from this company, so I couldn't just quit or half but it. I quickly learned that both of these transfers are lazy and useless. They'd been with the company for decades, had friends in the head office, and knew their jobs were safe. I'd show them how to do something and they'd flat out laugh and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. Every day I'd be trying to train them and they would ignore me, chat with each other, leave to go sit in the cafeteria. Leaving me to do a two-person job alone. Luckily I was good enough to handle the workload, but it was annoying. Mindful of the fact that I needed a reference of this company, I kept extensive notes on each day's progress. I clearly documented every single instance of the replacements refusing to learn, even listen to my instructions. I also followed up daily with my direct supervisor, and he knew what was going on. And my notes went into the company files and were passed up the line. Despite my scathing reports, head office did nothing. Now it's my last day. This is the day the training process assigned for letting the newbies work alone, with no help or supervision allowed, to see how well they handle the job and the pressure. I was, in writing, forbidden to help them or answer any questions. As I expected, things fell to poop pretty much immediately, minutes into the first batch of orders. One of the biggest printers jammed, and the clueless twats had no idea how to fix the printer jam. Because. They ignored me every time I tried to show them how dot so they turned to me, and demand that I fix things. I'm sitting on a desk, coffee in one hand, an apple in the other, and smile and say, yeah, I'm not doing that. So one of them is yelling at me while the other is basically thumping uselessly on the printer like a gorilla that just found a candy machine. Then a second printer jams dot paper starts spilling out of the back of the first printer, which, if you knew the job, was a really, really really bad warning sign. Well, I'm going to go to the cafeteria, good luck. I say as I stand up. As I'm leaving a here a third printer crunch and jam up. I went to my supervisor and let him know what was happening. He said he not only expected as much, he had predicted so repeatedly to his superiors. He once once again specifically forbade me from offering any help. So I went to the cafeteria and read my book for a little over an hour. Then my supervisor comes to me to let me know what happened. The entire printer room is down, every single printer either jammed up or actually broken. The company is losing thousands of dollars every single minute. One of the shipper slash receiving supervisors finds me, all in a panic, begging me to get the orders printed. Sorry, I'm not allowed to do that, I replied. Now several people are running around outside the cafeteria, all in a panic, running from place to place to figure out why they don't have any shipping orders. The chaos took hours to resolve. And I wasn't allowed to fix the problems. Anytime someone started giving me a hard time, my supervisor would intervene and show the memo from the bosses stating that I was forbidden to help in the printer room that day. I spent my entire last day at work drinking coffee, chatting with coworkers, and reading my book. The whole fiasco ended up costing the company tens of thousands of dollars. How did you get revenge on your ex-wife after she cheated? He sent all of her friends, family, workers, and children a link of her doing the most nastiest things to her secret lover. This takes place before smartphones were omnipresent. I had a friend, we'll call him Bob, that was suspicious of his wife's social circle. One of her closest friends had been caught cheating and tried to throw her under the bus as well. 
Bob had no proof and things settled down for a while. Bob was in a professional and very, very good with PCs and networks. Nearly a year later, Bob's wife is acting shady again after her high school reunion. He confides in me and we talk through some scenarios. He jokingly mentioned a keylogger. He finally asked me to just drop it and most of all, don't tell anyone, not even your wife. A couple months pass and I'm up early, 5 30 to 6, getting ready for work. I get a Facebook Messenger notification and see that I've been sent a link from Bob, but it's a group chat. It's literally everyone we know, her family, his family, our friends, strangers. Everyone. I didn't open it, it looked like a phishing link even though it came from him who's extremely cautious. A short while later I get an email from Bob with some ominous slash unsavory comments and the same link. It's a group email with the recipients open copied, his wife's work, her family, her friends, his family other people I didn't know. I knew it was legitimate now, so I opened it. The link was to a hastily made website containing pictures and videos of his wife and another man. This wasn't hidden camera footage, it was screenshots including video screen captures. Weeks worth of screenshots. He had captioned each item with snarky comments and colorful names for his wife and her lover. It was an embarrassing amount of evidence. Videos of her touching herself with her lover. Chat logs about how they can't wait to F again. Solo touching videos of her and him. Tons of pictures. And the straw that broke the camels. Back. Trash talking her husband to her lover. Comments about how much bigger and better he was. Her efforts to stroke her lover's ego were especially hurtful. I dropped what I was doing and called him. He was intoxicated and combative, he had been up all night making the website and drowning in liquor. Not one good word to say about women in general. He was extremely emotional but after some work I had convinced him to take the website down before it does irreparable damage to his marriage, their careers and his children. As he's sobbing and logging in to remove the website I hear loud yelling as she bursts into the room. A screaming match ensues and there's nothing I can do to pull him back. Apparently her mother or sister saw the page, blew up her phone until she woke up and answered. She saw the website and went on the offensive. The phone call drops after 30 seconds of her screaming while Bob is calling her a beach and I can't contact him again. The website was still up for the rest of the day and he was kind enough to put a view counter on it. Hundreds of people watched her jerking it with a married former classmate. Bob had done his homework. He installed a keylogger that records the whole screen. When he was out she would log into the PC and or Facebook and play with her boyfriend. Bob had found her lover, his family, his wife, his wife's family, his job, etc etc all these people were included in the Facebook and email groups. I do not know what became of her lover and his marriage, but I do know what happened to Bob's life. His wife was desperate to make amends, she tried and offered everything. In the end it was her comments about her lover and his prowess that were her undoing. Bob tried to take her back, even after all his friends and family had seen her naked and cheating. But he couldn't get over the comments about his manhood. Bob eventually left her, gained about 100 pounds and then finally moved as far away as possible and became a horrible human being. I have no idea what he's doing now as he went scorched earth with most friendships and his family. She's gross and has a face shaped like a bowling ball now. Line forms at the rear. Hate our class so much you fail almost all of them? Enjoy an early retirement. I had an English teacher named Mrs. Smith. Mrs. Smith, or how she liked to refer to herself, Dr. Smith, she didn't have a doctorate, was a mean old bat that hated anything and everything. She was ugly inside and out. To give a mental image of what she looks like, her face sagged so much it looked like she had a perpetual stroke. She had about two feet in between her eyebrows and her eyes. Imagine Ursula and Cruella Deville had a child and then that child had a baby with the devil. You get Mrs. Smith. None of the other English teachers liked her. There was nothing that they nor the administration could do due to her tenure. That is, until I became her student. Her teaching style included, but was not limited to, yelling at students, putting them down with petty insults, having us read to ourselves in the middle of class, kicking out students that were dozing off then later fall asleep at her desk, not letting female students go to the restroom for very obvious reasons, and the occasional losing students work then accuse the students of not turning their work in. This last part is what crossed the line for me. You see, I wasn't a grade A student and I sucked at English, so I always played my cards right and made friends with everyone. Students and teachers included. So when I struggled and couldn't do something on my own, I let my charm save me and cash out on my months of being nice to everyone. However, no one could be friends with Mrs. Smith. I tried being polite. I was met with rudeness. I tried asking her how her morning was. I was met with silence and dead stares. I tried asking how I could improve in my writing skills, she told me that she wasn't willing to help. Within the first week of class, I knew I had met my match. So halfway through the semester, we're working on a big research paper. However, the day after the due date, Mrs. Smith had to go up to Illinois for some family. Issues for two weeks. Mind you, we turned in our papers both in hand and on turnitin.com for plagiarism checking. No biggie. We won't get our grades back for a while but at least we won't have to deal with her bullsh tea. Or so we thought. A few days after she gets back, only about half of the students got their papers back. The other half, including myself, were sitting there staring and waiting, thinking that she was going to go back to her desk and pull out the remaining papers to return to her students. But nope, she told us to take out our textbooks and start reading Beowulf. Some students, including myself, that didn't receive their papers tried to interject and inquire about our papers, and she snapped back with you should have turned them in when they were due. In unison, we respond with we did. Of course, she denies it, and within a few days, our grades drop immensely. At the end of the grading period, second six weeks, our report cards show a big fat F for English. Everyone is livid. 
and the worst part is if you get anything below a C, you are to be moved to lower level English at the end of the semester. Between the zero from the paper that carried almost half of our grade and only a few weeks remaining in the semester, almost half of the class was doomed to fail out. Now, most of the students were happy with having to leave her class. There was not much they could do. But I was careful. Remember the teaching methods I mentioned above? Well Mrs. Smith thought that because we were in a classroom that had no cameras, her behavior wasn't being recorded. She was dead wrong. From the second week on, I started recording audio on my phone every day from the moment I walked into the class to the moment I left. Every. Day. I caught every single one of her personal attacks of students on tape. When she fell asleep, I pulled out my phone and recorded her. My pleas for help to improve and her refusal to help weren't left out either. Every day, I would go home, cut. The audio to keep the good parts. And every day, my collection of dirt on her grew. And remember how I said we use Turnitin.com as well as paper? I had coordinated with all of the other students who were going to fail to screenshot all of their Turnitin receipts and send them to me as proof that they turned in their work. When she decided to fail me for her mistake, she unleashed hell on herself. I went straight to the administration and scheduled a parent-teacher admin conference. A week later, my parents, the principal, the school counselor, the head of the English department, and Mrs. Smith were all present. I started with how she had lost half of the class's work and most of us failed because of it. She denied it and again accused us of turning out our work in late as well as cheating and a bunch of other bullshit and lies. I remained calmed and just pulled out a folder that contained all of the screenshots from my backpack and handed it to the principal who then passed it to the head of the English department who then asked Mrs. Smith to explain it. She instantly turned red in the face and started stuttering. Before she could get any words out, I say, that's not all. Listen to this I pull out my phone and start playing back the highlights from the semester. All the while, I'm staring dead into Mrs. Smith's eyes while trying to hold back a poop-eating grin. The suspense in the room would have unalived Jason Statham. After the audio finished the principal looked at me and said, I think we've seen enough and asked me to leave. I sat outside of the conference room savoring the muffled yelling through the walls. I'm pretty sure I heard my dad utter the words filthy a-hole but I don't want to point fingers. The parent-teacher conference was on a Friday. I walked into class the following Monday to see an empty desk and a substitute teacher we all recognized and loved. My wife ruined my time off from work by stepping on my boundaries and not allowing me to read books, so I'm trying not to lose my mind and hate her. I work a very demanding job. There are very few, if any, times during the year when I have the luxury to take a few days off to myself. When I get home from work, between cooking dinner, doing dishes, and taking care of chores around the house, I get maybe two hours a day to relax. My wife gets upset if I don't spend all of that time with her. So I don't get to watch my shows, play my video games, or read my books. I've told her many times that I need time to relax and do the things I enjoy, and she'll agree with me, but then start giving me things to do or try to get me to do something else with her within 30 seconds of me starting. So two months ago, I asked my boss if I could use a week of vacation between Christmas and New Year's. It's a slow week and we made arrangements to ensure that I am covered during those days for emergencies. I told my wife that this will be my me time to do all of the things that I want, to de-stress from life, and to catch up on the things that I really enjoy. I also plan to clean up my office and organize my files, which is something that has stressed me out for a while. My wife agreed and told me that she was very happy I'm going to be able to do some self-care. This weekend, she informed me that she had scheduled the chimney cleaners for Wednesday because I'd be home. She wrote down a list of things for me to do. Go to Home Depot, clean up the yard debris, pick up groceries for the week, go through boxes in the basement and organize everything. I politely informed her that I would not be doing any of those things, that this week was about self-care and addressing my needs, and with only four real days, minus Christmas, I was not going to add additional tasks. She told me to just get to what I had time for. On Tuesday, my wife decided to work from home. This prevented me from organizing my office since we share an office. I put on one of my video games and started to play. Ten seconds later, my wife came flying in and told me to turn it off because it was too loud while she was trying to make phone calls. I told her to shut the office door, but she told me it was entirely too loud and sounded unprofessional in the background. So I pulled out a book and started reading on the couch. I did that for about an hour when my wife decided to come out into the living room and work on her laptop. She turned on the Kardashians. I sarcastically asked if that wouldn't make her sound unprofessional in the background. She replied, I'll just mute it if a call comes in. Which is exactly what she did. So after 15 minutes of trash TV and loud business phone calls, I went into our bedroom to read my book. At this point, my wife kept interrupting me every few minutes. How's the book? How much more do you have to go? What's it about? Do you want lunch? What do you want for dinner? Are you still on the same book? Do you want to watch something on TV? Am I ruining your day? Do you not want to spend time with me? Do you know where the black water bottle went? Eventually it was time for dinner, so I just gave up and put my book down. Today, she decided to work from home again. I told her it wasn't necessary. She told me that she wanted to work from home. I replied, yes, but no offense, I do not want you here. She laughed and said, I know, it's your self-care week, but I don't feel like going in. We can both be here. So I could not be in the office, I had to be up early for the chimney cleaners, and could not be in the living room because they were working there. I went into our bedroom and started reading my book. She came in and informed me that I needed to stay with the chimney sweepers in case they had questions because she had work calls that she had to take. I was unable to concentrate with them working, so I just sat there. When they finally finished, I took my book out and started reading. 
That's when my wife decided to come out into the living room and turn on the Kardashians again. I migrated into the bedroom, laid down on the bed, and continued reading my book. Ten minutes later, she came in with her laptop and laid down on the bed next to me. I did my best to ignore the typing and phone calls and just concentrate on my book. Then she started snoring. Not heavy breathing, but literal congested wheezing, choking, snoring. I sighed, got up, headed into the living room, laid down on the couch and put one of my shows on. That lasted 15 minutes before my wife came in and started talking through it. She kept asking questions about it, criticizing it, talking about how it's clear why she wouldn't watch it, asking how many episodes there are, how long each episode is, and so on. Finally after needing to rewind the same part 8 times, I accepted defeat and turned it off. My wife informed me that she thinks she's going to work from home the rest of the week. She saw the look on my face, smiled and said, I know, I'm cramping your style and ruining your week off, but it's a quiet week and it works for me to be home. I told her, I love spending time with you, but I need my alone time. I haven't been able to do anything for me and it is damaging to my mental health. She insists that she understands and she wants me to have time to myself, but it seems to be in theory only, not in practice. I have found myself snapping at her and being terse with her and I do not want that. I am afraid that I am going to explode on her. I don't know how to make myself any clearer but she doesn't seem to be taking me seriously. My delusional boss wrongly fired me after another co-worker's mistake, so I sued him and ruined his marriage. Back when I was still in university, I used to work for a hotel to make ends meet. When I started the hotel very urgently needed new personnel. So I cut a deal with the old owner about getting to choose and pick shifts, so I could visit my courses and exams. Speaking some extra foreign languages I also got a little bonus each month on top. The old owner was a great guy. He owned multiple hotels so I rarely saw him. But when he was in the house he always made a point to have drinks with the staff, chat with us and if we were free he even invited those of the front desk to fancy restaurants who were not on shift. Fast forward. I had worked in the hotel for a few years now and was nearing the completion of my studies. So it wouldn't have been an eternity until I had to quit anyway. As I was of course more interested to work in my field of study. As part of my deal with the old owner I mostly chose to work night shifts. Allowing me to visit my courses at university during the day. To make up for my privileges I had picked up the habit of doing some extra work in the dead of night other shifts would normally have to do, when I in contrast could have sat around and stared at the walls. People were grateful for the help in the beginning. And we became a rather tight-knit group. But over time people rotated in and out. When the old owner retired and his a-hole of a son took over the business as the new owner, I already feared the worst. The new owner didn't like me very much. I never found out the exact reason for that one. I was at that point nearly the sole veteran left from when I started. Among the tasks I had taken on was doing light clerical tasks to ease the manager's job in the morning. For that, I generally had to use the manager's network account. One night while doing my lists, I logged into the manager's account and emailed to do my job. Then I saw an email. With my name in the subject line. I know it is not nice to snoop, but of course, I read it. Turns out the new owner wanted to get rid of me. I still had my old employee contract with the bonuses for foreign language abilities and was allowed by my contract to pick and choose shifts. I can only assume these privileges are what made the new owner hate me. No idea if he had other reasons. Because to be honest these seem very weak to me. But he couldn't fire me without cause. On top of that, I would be owed severance if fired. And generally, there were not enough bodies in the shift rotation without me. Though the new owner didn't seem to understand the point as the emails told me. I looked for more emails concerning me and found them. There was an email chain between some of the employees, the manager and the new owner. I was of course not ceased as I was the hated topic. The employees didn't like me hogging the night shifts. Because those paid better and for every night you worked you got paid the night bonus. The manager was the only one rather neutral on the matter and just curbed their enthusiasm to get rid of me, as they needed me to be fully staffed. The new owner, and my colleagues actively conspired to make a hostile work environment so I would quit of my own volition. I was furious. I thought about a variety of reactions. From egging their cars to burning down the hotel. But I settled on a less crazy method of revenge. I called my uncle at 2 AM asking for advice. My uncle is a lawyer. So for the sake of proof, I forwarded myself all the emails. I made photos, printed them out, made copies and filmed the whole deal just to be sure. My uncle told me to sit tight and see if things got worse, or if it was just bluster. And so I gave it a few days. And things did take a turn. Snide remarks about my looks, clothing and so on were only the tip of the iceberg. Some of the colleagues were just as professional as before. But the conspirators always left extra work for. Me or pond of shit duties they normally had to do on me. I always kept a spare shirt and suit at work, just to have a change, which suddenly disappeared. One guy even started to threaten me with violence. But I kept clenching my butt cheeks. I would not give them the satisfaction of saving on the severance or giving in. I am a big boy after all. I did, however, stop doing any extra work, I was not obligated to do. Which in the end was the reason they used to fire me. They still had to pay me severance. The next day my uncle with bundled proof of the email and all documented harassment by my colleagues served the hotel my lawsuit. It started with wrongful termination and ended with harassment. Reportedly the manager went white as a sheet when he realized where the emails must have come from. The new owner had been on vacation and had to cancel his expensive vacation in France to deal with this. Their counsel advised them to settle. So I accepted my severance and a hefty bonus on top. Enough money to last me until the end of university without work. But that was not all my revenge. I had gone after the new owner's money. But in the next step, I went after the hotel. 
I had used all the spare time during night shifts alone, to document every last violation of city, county, district, state and federal law I could find. That went from minor things like some harmless mold under the kitchen sink to substantial violations like modifications to the building. The building was under a limited form of historical protection by federal law, on the grounds of being built and inhabited by somewhat important historical figures a few hundred years back. So every renovation or change in floor plans needs to be signed off on by a committee. Which can take ages. There is also a grant paid to the new owner by the government for keeping the building intact as is. So with my uncle's help, I sent documentation of every violation I could find to the corresponding agency. In one month. Everything from health, building code, fire safety to the finance and work police crawled over the hotel. In the end, it was the building and fire inspectors that shut the place down. The new owner had done substantial renovations to the top floor luxury apartments, which he used when he was in town. So the new owner had to pay back the grant, pay fines for unauthorized alterations to the building, endangering his guests, because something wasn't built right according to fire code and had to close down shop until the building was fixed. I also tipped off a friend who had studied journalism and worked at a local paper. The paper ran an article on all the violations accumulated. Which tanked the business once it had reopened, as the newspaper article had led to horrible reviews. In the end, to afford all the fines, repayments and building costs the new owner sold the hotel. As the cherry on top, all the assholes who had tried to harass me lost their job. Granted, the people who didn't do anything to me lost their jobs too. But didn't do anything to stand up for me or help me either. So I don't feel too much remorse. And the revenge cherry on top was, that the new owner, whenever he was in town used to bring home escorts. Which in my country is not illegal. But he was married. It took some doing to get that information to the new owner's wife. But one of my former colleagues, who had quit before this had all happened, had her email. So I let her know what the new owner was up to when he was out of town. I don't know what exactly happened, but they did divorce in the end. Make of that what you will. My entitled cousin tried to get her sister's wedding postponed and not ruin her cruise trip plans, so she was uninvited from the wedding and threatened to be removed from her dad's will. Ever since I was young, I have been best friends with my cousin, Amanda. Her father, my uncle, started a very successful business so they have always been wealthy, although they live modestly. She has an older brother and her identical twin sister, Sally. You may think the good twin, evil twin scenario is only seen on the TV screen, but Amanda and Sally are the real-world equivalent. Amanda is kind and generous while Sally is selfish and entitled. Sally always had this idea in her head that, because her dad was so wealthy, she didn't have to lift a finger in life to get what she wanted. Good things just came to her, Amanda, and their brother, but Amanda had the common sense to know that she can't always rely on daddy's money. Despite getting pretty much everything they wanted growing up, Amanda and her brother never had entitled attitudes. Their parents are also super nice so Sally was always the evil standout of the family. Sally's attitude only got worse as time went on. Eventually, Sally got married and had a kid, a boy. Sally's husband is just as nasty as she is so they were kind of made for each other. Sally always wanted to rub her child in Amanda's face like she wanted gloat about having a kid before she did. Amanda had a history of bad relationships including those that involved verbal and physical abuse. One time, she came to her sister for advice after her boyfriend beat her. Sally had the nerve to blame her weight and not using makeup to make herself more attractive. Amanda was afraid to date anyone after her last relationship disaster, but that changed when she finally met the man of her dreams, Tom. I met Tom personally and he's a giant teddy bear of a guy. He's the perfect guy to help heal Amanda's old wounds and give her the loving, happy life she deserves. Then. Nearly two years after they met, Amanda and Tom were engaged. The entire family was thrilled that Amanda finally got the man of her dreams and her father wanted to throw a boatload of money to her to help pay for a beautiful wedding. For future reference, he did the same thing for Sally when she got married, yet Sally was not happy about how extravagant Amanda's wedding was going to be. Amanda wanted to be married at Niagara Falls and invite basically everyone she knew and her father was going to pay for pretty much all of it. Sally was furious. She talked to Amanda and their father about the wedding and how all the money being spent better not interfere with the family's upcoming cruise. Their father said that because of the wedding and how expensive it was going to be, the family cruise would have to be pushed back another year or two. Sally practically exploded. She blamed Amanda for taking the cruise away from her and her precious boy who was five at this point. She said she told her son how they were going on a cruise and how he's going to be so upset now because his selfish aunt wanted to get married instead of giving him a happy week in the tropics. Sally even had the audacity to demand Amanda to reschedule the wedding for next year so they could go on the cruise instead. Amanda, who is normally not a confrontational person, had it with her sister's attitude and told her if she wanted to go on a cruise, she would have to pay for it herself. Sally and her husband were nowhere near as wealthy as their father and there was no way he was going to reschedule his own daughter's wedding just to give Sally what she wanted. Sally's ranting went on for weeks flipping back and forth between blaming her sister for ruining her son's year and begging her father for money to go on a cruise because she and her family deserved it. She drove Amanda to tears and she ended up calling me up for advice. My only advice to her was to give Sally, who normally gets everything. Nothing, and by nothing, I mean don't invite her to the wedding. Like most sisters would do, Amanda wanted Sally to be one of her bridesmaids as she was a bridesmaid at Sally's wedding. 
Not inviting her would be a major upset for everyone involved, but it just may be the thing to teach Sally a lesson. So she did just that. Amanda called up her sister and flat out told her that if she didn't change her attitude, she didn't want it leaving a sour taste at her wedding. Again, Sally blew up shouting at Amanda, calling her all sorts of names, and again blaming her for the cruise being cancelled. Amanda hung up and decided to not invite her to the wedding. The wedding was amazing and I ended up being the bridesmaid to take Sally's place. Yes, I was invited to the wedding originally, but Amanda didn't want me to be a bridesmaid only because she knew I hated dresses and I'd rather wear a suit, but I said I'd wear a dress just for her special day. It's been a few years now and Amanda and Tom have a beautiful little girl and have a baby boy on the way. Sally is still in their lives and is still nasty as ever, but she doesn't come to her father begging for anything anymore, because after her behavior towards him and Amanda, he threatened to leave her out of his will if she continued to pester either of them. Maybe now that she's not going to get everything handed to her on a silver platter, she'll change her attitude for the better, or at least that's what we all wish to happen.